Okay, so today we're just going to work through the Chapter 7 Practice Problems from Solomons. And these are just taken from our course materials. And I do, as always, recommend that you stop the video and try to work the problem on your own first, and then come back and use the video as a resource. Okay, so for question one, this is EZ, and I don't think we've talked about E versus Z nomenclature before. So if you ever have a, let me just grab a note card real quick. If you ever have a structure that has two clearly higher priority groups on either side, you know that these are cis and trans, right? So these two, this is cis, this is trans. But what happens if you have something like this? Is this cis or trans? That gets a lot more complicated. So the way E and Z nomenclature work, E is the um, German word for, I think, intigen or indigen. I'm not positive how to say it. But I think of E as opposite. And they're both vowels, so that's easier to remember. And then Z is the German word for Zeus summon, I believe, which is same. So I think Z, same. So if the higher priorities are on the same side, then that's Z. And if the higher priorities are on opposite side, then that's E. So the way that you determine priorities is actually the same way you determine priorities for R and S. So if we look at just this carbon and you only look at one carbon at a time, you'll have the higher priority on the bromine and the lower priority on the CH3 group. Now, if we look at the other carbon, this is a hydrogen down there, it's implied. So the higher priority will go on the CH3 group and the lower priority will go on the hydrogen. So the higher priority groups are on the same side. So this would be Z. If this was arranged like this and your hydrogen and bromine are on the same side, they would be on opposite sides, so that would be E. So E, integer, opposite, Z, same, same. That's how I remembered. I just turned that S into a Z. <laughs> so um, this is a nomenclature question, which you should be able to do the nomenclature part pretty easily. The only thing that's different is this EZ. Um, alcohol is a high priority, so we're going to start with that side to find the parent chain. So I find one, two, th one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's hexane. And then I look for all of our substituents. So we have one all, so that's a suffix. It'll go at the end. Two methyl. Two ene. For ein. So this is interesting because we have basically like three suffix on here. So the end is going to be <laughs> ein, ein, all. So instead of hexane, it'll be hexene, ein, all, which is a mouthful. <laughs> and you've got a number each one of these. So I'm going to go ahead and combine this as two methyl. You can do, you can do this in one of two ways. I like to put the number right before, so you could do like 4-ene or whatever it is, 4-ine, 2-ene, like that. You do like 4-hex-ene, 2-ine. I like to put the number right before. So I'll do hex 2-ene, and I do ene first because technically ine has a higher priority when it comes to putting it at the end of the name. 4-ine. And notice I'm dropping the vowels instead of E and E, it's just E N, Y and E, just Y N, because you only have a vowel on the very last one, and then one all. So this is the overall name that I would go with. Um, two methyl hex two E and four I and one all. The different you could do that I was trying to explain, I think technically this would be correct, would be two hex in. Four I one all like have the two not right before the E N, but that is not as specific, and I U pack is moving away to from that towards this. So then we can narrow it down to just these names. So this has five methyl, but we know that's wrong because you want to start with the lowest priority, getting the lowest or the highest priorities, getting the lowest numbers, and then one methyl. There's no way the methyl would have to be right there. So. It's between E or Z of this name. And the way we determine E or Z is, like I said, you give priority to each substituent. So this priority group is pretty obvious. The hydrogen is the lower priority. 
and then this big carbon chain is the higher priority. It gets trickier when they're both carbon chains, but it's the same as when we're doing our S and R priorities. So the first car the first one's both carbons. This is attached to three hydrogens. This is attached to two hydrogens and an oxygen. So that one is the higher priority. So these are on opposite sides. So that would be opposite. That's a vowel. So is E. So this would be E to methyl. So that's how we get to C. Uh, answer choice C. <laughs> I was like throwing E, Z, C, all that at you. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next question, most heat per mole. So highest heat of hydrogenation is going to be lowest energy. So highest heat is lowest energy. I always write out which one it's asking for. Highest heat, lowest energy. So like this is asking for the least stable option for you. So the highest heat of hydrogenation, lowest energy, it's going to be the least stable. So I guess that's lowest energy doesn't make as much sense. Higher heat of hydrogenation would be less stable, not less energy. So I'll switch to saying that instead. Highest heat, least stable. So let's talk about stability of double bonds. Double bonds are more stable when they're internal. And they're more stable when they're trans than cis or Z versus E. So if we're looking for the highest heat of energy, we're looking for the least stable. So that would be an external double bond. What I mean by internal versus external, here's an internal double bond. It's in the middle of a molecule. Here's an external, it's at the end. So that's gonna be less stable. Internal is gonna be more stable. Now what I mean, cis versus trans, if you had this structure and this structure, the one on the right, the trans, is going to be more stable. And the cis is less stable. Okay, so internal more stable, trans is more stable. This is asking for the highest heat per mole, which means the least or lowest stability. So we want something that's not internal and that's not trans. So automatically, answer A drops out jumps out at me because it's an external double bond. Another way you can say internal is more substituted. So the more substitutions you have, the better. So another example of that is this double bond will be more stable than this double bond because this has two things that aren't hydrogen and this only has one thing that isn't hydrogen. Another way of looking at it is this would probably be more stable than that because it has more substitutions. So the more substitutions, the better. This has less substitution, so that's the least stable. If you had to rank these, these cis bonds would be less stable than the trans bonds. So you can also rank it like that. This is more stable than this. This is more stable than this. That's just a kind of a way to check yourself to see what is the most stable. Okay, next question. What is the major product for the following reaction? So one thing that I think is really valuable to do um, once you're getting further along in organic chemistry is ask yourself, what kind of reaction is this checking for? So usually I would look for, is this an acid-base reaction? That's one to check. And if it's not an acid base, so there's not an obvious proton that's going to leave, then what's the next thing that it could be? Well, in this case, we have a strong nucleophile, a good leaving group, and heat. So that makes me think it's going to be an elimination reaction. So we've talked about the, uh, the tree that I go through to determine elimination reactions. So if your nucleophile is strong, usually that's a negative charge then it's gonna to go to the two side. If it's weak, usually that's a non-negative charge. It's gonna to go to the one. And if you've got a bulky base, if it's secondary or tertiary, or if it's heat, it could go to E2. If it's a narrow base, if it's primary or secondary, 
and um, no heat, it's going to go to SN2. And then you've got similar factors on the other side. So in this case, we have a strong nucleophile with this um, ETONA that's basically an F oxide. So it's a negative charge. The Na is just a counter ion. And the F oxide that's strong, it's pretty narrow, but the heat is what leads it to be E2. So this is going to be an E2 reaction. So for an E2 reaction, you have one of two options. Sorry for the interruption. Um, I guess you guys don't know. I paused the recording, but <laughs> there's a lot going on. They're working on construction upstairs, so it's pretty loud. Okay, so right here, um, we had just decided this is an E2 reaction. So for an E2 reaction, you have two options. You look at either side of the carbon that your leaving group is attached to. So here's where your leaving group is attached to. So here or here is where your options are going to be. Okay, so you can either take this hydrogen or you could take one from here if there was. But in this case, there's not a hydrogen here, here, or here, right? So you only have one option in this particular case of an E2 reaction. Sorry, my computer's going crazy. So you only have one option in this E2. So your ethoxide is going to come and take the one proton that's available adjacent to your leaving group. You'll make a new bond right here in the middle, and then the leaving group is going to leave. And so the product that will form be a double bond right here. Your two methyls will stay there. There's no carbocation form formation, so there's no rearrangement. So you just have the one-step reaction, your E2 one-step reaction and the double bond will form right there. So that is answer choice A. Okay, for question four, this one is tricky. I have had a lot of people ask questions about this one. So the first step, when we get to this far in organic chemistry, I always check, is it an acid base? Is it an elimination or substitution reaction? And then once you get into the next ones, could it be an addition reaction or something like that? Well, in this case, this is not an acid-base reaction. There's no hydrogen that's easily available. So what we have is a I minus, so a strong nucleophile, and um, a good leaving group. There's no heat. This is a pretty narrow nucleophile. So I'm going to say this is probably going to be a substitution reaction, and it's going to be on the strong side. It's strong because, or uh, the E2 side. What? I'm sorry, I just lost my brain. It's strong, so it's going to be on the two side, and then I think it's going to be a substitution, not an elimination because it's a secondary, there's no heat, and this is pretty narrow. So those things are what makes me go this way on the little flow chart. Flow chart, remember, if it's weak, it goes to the one side, and then uh, if there's heat, it goes to an elimination. If there's a bulky base, it goes to an elimination. And if there's, for this case, a tertiary or a secondary is favored. Secondary can go either way, so you have to look at other factors. On this side, it's a lot harder because the first step is the carbocation formation. And between that, basically, you have to look at either the base is bulky or there's heat. So E1's a lot harder to tell. But in this case, we have a strong nucleophile, so it's going to go to 2 and it's narrow, and there's no heat, and it's a secondary, so I'm going to go SN2. So I think that's a substitution. So the I- minus is going to come attack and kick this out. It's all in one step, and there's an inversion of stereochemistry. So with an inversion of stereochemistry, that becomes a dash instead of a wedge. It basically comes in from the front side in this case and kicks out the back-facing Cl2 group. That's what we call it a backside attack. So that's our new structure. Now the next thing that happens is O minus, so this uh, T bu, that means tert butyl, the oxygen is it's a butoxide, and the K, so that's O minus, and the K is a positive charge. The structure looks like this. So that's strong, but it's bulky. So that's going to go towards the elimination side. So instead of a substitution, we're probably going to get an elimination here. So if we get an elimination, This will come in, 
attack. It's so bulky that it's going to go for that outer proton and not the inner one. That's called the, I think that's the Hoffman product. The sites of it is the more substituted. So it's going to come and attack. Double bond is going to form here and the leaving group is going to leave. So that's going to leave us with this structure. So most students get this pretty easily. They get this and then they don't understand why the answer is not E. Well, the thing is, this reaction, or this molecule, has a double bond on this side. In both answer choice D and E, the, the double bond is on the left side of that molecule. So if we wanted to flip this molecule over and have the double bond on the left side, your wedge becomes a dash. If something's sticking out at you, and then you flip it over, now it's going away from you. So this wedge is sticking out at you. You flip the molecule over to get the double bond on the right side, and now it becomes a dash. So that's why the right answer is D. So that's a frustrating one because if you got to this point, you clearly know the concepts really well, but it's just a question of do you know the arrangement of the molecule on the page? So that's more of a stereochemistry question from chapter five even than, or four even, than it is a elimination or substitution question. Okay. Question five. Which compound listed below would you expect to be the major product when 2-bromo-2-methylbutane is refluxed with KOH and ethanol? Okay, this is a tricky one because you've got to know what the word reflux means. You've probably done this in lab, but basically it's a forever boil. You're boiling something and it has a condenser attached to the top. So that when the boiled solvent, so imagine if you had a pot of water with some crazy condenser on top, you're boiling the water, it hits the condenser, cools down, and comes back down into the pot to be boiled again. You've done this in lab, I'm sure, but basically what reflux means is heat. So the question is, what is the major product when 2-bromo-2-methylbutane, so 2-bromo-2-methylbutane is refluxed or has heat and OH- minus in ethanol. So OH minus is strong, so that's going to go to the 2 side. But we've got heat, so I think that's going to go to an elimination reaction. So for this elimination reaction, you can go to either side, this side or this side, right? You always have two choices. This is a narrow base. It's not bulky. So it's going to give you the site Ceph product. I think this is how you spell it. Sometimes it's spelled like this. Which is going to give you the more substituted double bond. So in this case, it could choose either side, either this or this. If it chose the middle, double bonds formed here, this leaves, and you end up with Double bond right there. Let's see. I think I got this. One, two, three, four. So your double bond is between carbon two and three. We lost the proton from there. And carbon one has two methyl groups. Oh, yeah, I did that. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is our internal product. This is the site Ceph product. The Hoffman product would be if the base went for the other one. So if the base came here to this proton and formed a double bond between carbons one and two, and then the leaving group left. So that would give you the methyl still carbon two, something that looks like this. So these are kind of your two options, right? Either the site Ceph product or the Hoffman product. In this case, you have a more narrow, not bulky base. And so it's going to give you, it's easily accessible to the inside of this uh, molecule. So it's going to give you the sites of product, which is the more stable product. So that should be answer choice D. Now, I don't even think they have, so if you chose this one, I don't even think they have that as an Option. Oh, yeah, it does for C. Never mind. <laughs> uh, you can go ahead and eliminate these substitution reactions because you know it's going to be elimination, so that narrows it down just to these three. 
Okay, next question, question six. What is the major product of the following reaction? Okay, this is your classic, this is terbutoxide. There's three CH3s around a carbon with an L minus. So that's your classic bulky base. It's a minus charge, so it's strong. It's bulky and there's heat, so it's gonna be an elimination for sure. Also, because it's bulky, it's going to choose the less stable Hoffman product because that's easier for it to get. Also, there's not even a hydrogen here as a secondary option. So that kind of helps you out. There's three carbons, not a hydrogen right here. So the only hydrogen available to make this double bond would be right there on the edge. So this will steal the proton. The electrons will come and form a double bond, and then this bromine will leave all in one step for your E2 reaction. There's no rearrangement because a carbocation is not formed. So this should be your final answer. So CH3, C, CH, CH3, 1, 2, 3, 3 CH3s, the carbon, carbon with a hydrogen off of it. There's an implied hydrogen because there's only three bonds here, and then a carbon with two hydrogens. There's a double bond between them. So answer choice B is the right answer. This one's hard because you have to be able to quickly convert condensed formula into bond line formula. So that's something that you'll want to practice. Okay. Now, if there was a proton available here, and if this was narrow, then of course you could get a double bond right here, but that's not the case for this problem. I think that's one of the hardest things about this chapter is knowing when you're going to get a substitution versus uh, an elimination. And then when you have an elimination, is it Hoffman or Seitzer? That kind of makes it challenging. If it's an E1, it's also, is there rearrangement? So there's all kinds of things to look out for that you just have to think to check for all those things in each one of these settings. What's the major reaction formed when cis 1-bromo-2-methylcyclohexane reacts with sodium isopropoxide and isopropanol? Okay. So let's see, we've got cis 1-bromo 2-methyl cyclohexane. So usually the, well, I guess we should check and make sure if this is going to be an E2. If this is an E2, you need to make sure your hydrogen is what's called anti-periplanar. And that means, is there a hydrogen going the opposite direction on the opposite side? So when it's around a single bond, that's really easy to get because it rotates. But when it's in a ring like this, especially for a cyclohexane, it needs to be axial. They need to both be axial. So that's a lot harder. So that's something we're going to look out for. So let's see. One bromo, two methyl cyclohexane reacts with sodium isopropoxide and isopropanol. So isopropoxide looks like this. That is a little bit on the bulkier side. I feel like it's tricky. It could kind of go either way, which is hard. Um, but I would say I'm going to go with that's going to be an E2 reaction in this case because it is branched right here and making it bulkier. So because it's negative, that goes to the east, the two side. So it could be either a substitution or an elimination. And then the fact that it's bulky, I'm going to say it goes to elimination. And this is secondary. So if this is primary, I'd much more likely to say substitution. But being secondary, it could go either way. And having something bulky right next to it, both of those things lead me to believe we're going to an elimination. And what's hard about this too is in real life, you'd probably get a mixture of substitution and elimination products. But we want to know what the major products are for them. So it's going to be the easiest reaction to happen. And I think in this case, an elimination would be the easiest reaction to happen. So now I'm going to convert this from... Uh, wedge dash to boat chair. If this bromine is axial, then the next wedge is going to be equatorial, which means there is is an axial hydrogen. So one's axial pointing up, one's axial pointing down. That means that this reaction could take place right here. On the other side, both of these are hydrogen, so definitely you're going to have an axial hydrogen. So these are the leaving group and the hydrogen are in line in the proper way that they need to for the E2 reaction to take place. I'm not going to get too in-depth into this anti-periplanar idea. It's basically the same thing as the backside attack, but the base is stealing the hydrogen that's most easily available to it, 
and that's where you're gonna end up with this. Okay, so we've got our base. It's gonna come in and steal one of our hydrogens. Gonna form a double bond and the leaving group's gonna leave. So I just had the double bond forming between these two. So in that case, this wedge is unaffected and the double bond forms right here. So I drew this hydrogen being taken and the double bond forming right there and the leaving group leaving. If it takes from the other side, from this carbon, a double bond will form right here, and your leaving group will leave, same as always. But in this case, you're going to lose the wedge. It's going to become an sp. You lost the hydrogen. So instead of being tetrahedral, where it's going all crazy in different directions, it's flat. It's an sp2 hybridized. So that's why um, we have that structure here. That's going to be one of our right answers. And then B will be our other right answer. These would maybe occur in really small amounts. Well, not three, because if it was an S and two, it would be, it would come in from the back. So it would be a dash, not a wedge. But so this would maybe exist in really small amounts, but I think these two are going to be more likely to form. This couldn't form at all. That would be impossible. So, <laughs> uh, so the right answer would be answer choice C. Okay. Oh, and even if you weren't sure if it was going to be S and 2 or not, if you knew that C couldn't happen at all, you could definitely eliminate D and E. So that's another way that you can check yourself because I was kind of on the fence. I was like, this could go substitution or elimination. This is bulky enough that I think it's going to go elimination. But if you know that C can't form at all, then C and D are both, they're impossible because this, these two answers, D and E, contain structure three. So that can help you narrow it down as well. Okay, that's just thinking through every piece of that puzzle. This is where these reactions just get complicated and you have to think about every possible avenue. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Okay, is this the same question? Yes, question eight is a repeat of question seven. Oh, and you know what? So is nine. I remember this now. Yeah, okay. So all these are a repeat of each other. I don't know why that happens. Okay, so let's skip ahead to question 10. Which would initially produce the most stable carbocation? Initially to me means before rearrangement. I always spell wrong on the whiteboard. Okay, before rearrangement. And generally, tertiary is going to be stronger, more stable. The secondary is going to be more stable than primary. Methyl carbocations don't really happen. So in this H2SO4 reaction, the first thing that happens is the lone pair on the alcohol takes one of these protons and you'll get OH2+, plus, which is a good leaving group. OH by itself is not a good leaving group. OH2 plus is a good leaving group because if it leaves, it's just water. So it'll be happy. And you get HSO4 minus. So once you have that, this leaving group leaves, and that's where you get your carbocation. So the same thing happens with all of these. All of these alcohols will be converted to OH2+. And then the leaving group will leave. So let's draw all of them. So this was structure A. So B. This is tertiary. B is secondary, so automatically it's not as good as A. C is, oh, I drew one too many carbons. The carbocation forms right here after the alcohol leaves. So this is primary, so that's definitely not as good as A. A D, when the questions are all squenched up like this, the letters and the molecules, make sure you're getting the right one because Sometimes if you have it like this, you'll think, oh, D is the right answer, and you circle it, and actually that letter goes with E. So don't make that kind of mistake. Um, I make that kind of mistake a lot. So this leaving group leaves, so it's primary, so that's not right either. So the right answer is going to be answer choice A. Okay, and 11 and 12 are also repeats of 10. Yeah, I forgot that that happened. Kind of weird. Um, if you don't feel like you got enough practice problems because there is those repeats, definitely check out the ACS study guide for organic chemistry. It has good questions in there. 
Okay, which of the following would be the major product for this reaction? Okay, this is a new kind of question. If you have a double bond and H2 and mostly any kind of metal, you'll see palladium, that's PD. You'll see palladium on carbon, nickel. Anything like that is pretty much going to give you what's called hydrogenation. You've probably heard the word hydrogenation before because of hydrogenated oils. Like if that's what margarine is made out of, hydrogenated oils. Um, so they are going to add two hydrogens, one on each side, and it's basically going to delete the double bond. What's important about this, though, is that they'll add to the same side. So you'll get two hydrogens on the same side. And the reason for that is, so like say you have a bunch of nickel, that nickel is going to catalyze the reaction, but it's a solid surface, right? It's just metal. And it's going to have all these hydrogen atoms sitting on it. That's how it catalyzes the reaction, kind of lines up the hydrogen atoms. And then this double bond is going to come down and pick up those two hydrogens. So they have to add to the same side. So this question is asking you a number of things. It's asking you, do you know that the hydrogens are going to add on the same side? Do you know that D2 is basically the same thing as H2, just like a marked hydrogen? So D2 acts the same as A2. It's just like marked. And can you convert from axial to equatorial? <laughs> it's asking you a lot. So let's do that. If it adds to the same side, we're going to end up with, let's do this first. I jumped a little bit ahead of myself. I'm going to do two wedges. I just like wedges better. There's no real reason. And they're going to be deuteriums and then a CH3. So if we have a wedge and a wedge, it's axial and equatorial because cis and trans are not the same thing as axial and equatorial. So we're going to have one axial D, one equatorial D, and this axial D also has an equatorial CH3. So this is the right structure. So one is going to be a right answer. Just in case there's multiple, I'm going to check. Both of these are axial, so this would be this would be trans. This would have to be a wedge for that to work. Um, same thing, these are both equatorial, so there would have to be a wedge and a dash. These are both on the same hydrogen, so it'd be like if two deuteriums added there, so that's not possible. And instead of adding across the double bond, this one added at one, two, three, four, one, four. So one, four. <laughs> so the deuterium's added here and here. So that wouldn't work either. So the only possible answer is answer choice A. Okay, now for question 14, NH2 is a strong base. And when you have this kind of terminal alkyne with NH2 and liquid ammonium, it's going to steal the proton. This is an acid-base reaction. So remember how I said... Whenever you're doing these questions later on, you're going to ask yourself, is there an acid-base reaction possible? What about substitution elimination? And then you'll start to get into these addition reactions, like actually hydrogenation is an addition reaction. And in chapter eight, you're going to do like BR2, that's an addition reaction. So in this case, this is a strong base and there's an easily available pretty acidic proton. So that's going to give you an acid-base reaction first. So this is going to be the product of your first step. You're going to add this base to a primary. So this is a strong base with a primary halogen. So that's not going to be an acid base reaction beyond that. It's going to become an SN2 reaction. So it's strong. So that's why it goes to the two side. And then it's a primary. So you're not going to get a primary elimination. It's almost always going to be a primary substitution. So this will come and attack and kick this out. And your product will be, and notice I'm drawing this carbon-carbon triple bond in a straight line. And the reason for that is it's sp hybridized. So in real life, it's a straight line with the atoms bonded on the either side of it. So you can get points off for not at drawing that properly. So let's see, one, two, three. I always number my carbons because I lose them. Uh, five, four, three. Two, one. I, these are arbitrarily numbered. I did not number these according to IUPAC standards. I think the numbering would be opposite. So your iron would have a lower group on there, but I just was numbering to make sure I didn't lose any carbons. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that should be right. So without the numbers, it looks something like this. Okay. And now we have H2 with excess palladium on carbon. So this is going to do exactly what we talked about up here. 
this the palladium on carbon is the metal the protons are going to line up and this is going to dip down and pick them up but it's actually going to do that twice so this carbon carbon tri triple bond is going to become a carbon carbon single bond so your right answer is answer b And 15 is a repeat of that again. <laughs> uh, 16 has an interesting twist. So it's very similar. We'll go through it. But if you see H2 and P2 or Lindlar's catalyst, that's what's called poisoned. It's a poisoned hydrogenation. So it can only go from a triple bond to a double bond. It can't go all the way to a single bond like we saw in the last question. And it's going to be cis, I believe, because it's still like they line up, you know, on the same way. Okay, so the first in butyl lithium, that's a strong base. So it's basically, oh, it's in butyl. So one, two, three, four, the in means normal or straight line. But if it's a butyl with a lithium, that means it must be negative charge and the lithium is a positive charge. So it's basically this negative carbon. And there's no good leaving group. So the only option here is going to be another acid base reaction. So we'll end up with a lone pair. And you remember how to check and see if this reaction will proceed forward. You've got to look at the pKa of the acid and the conjugate acid. Okay, so this comes in attack and kicks the bromine out. Oh, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. So that's how we get this. You're going to add it to this primary amine. This is basically the exact same reaction we just saw, only with a few more carbons in it. It's primary, so it's going to be SN2 again. And it'll add on like this. Let's make sure we get it right. One, two, three carbons. I'm at a shorted one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, six, five, four. Three, two, yeah. Okay, so it'll look like this. One, two, three. That's why I always count my carbons. I always lose carbon. So I always number my carbons. <laughs> no matter how long you've been doing this, you're not immune. You can still lose your carbons unless you're just really amazing, which I guess I'm not. So, <laughs> um, And then you're going to get the same thing where you get the hydrogenation and it's going to be on the same side. So that's going to give you a cis double bond. And you're not going to do it twice in this setting. You've got your hydrogens have added on this side because you're not going to do it twice because this has got the P2. It's poisoned. It's also known as Lindlar's catalyst. It's going to stop at the addition of a double bond at the cis formation, and that's going to give you answer choice D. Okay, so I hope this was helpful video for you for Chapter 7 practice problems. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out, let me know, and I hope this helps out.